Good afternoon. My name is Erica James, and I am the Dean of the Guayzueta Business School. And it is really my delight to welcome everyone to the fifth annual Impact Showcase Day. For those of you who have been with us before, you know that this is one of the culminating events for the Guayzueta Business School graduate business school students. Uh, and it's an opportunity for them to highlight significant work projects working with uh, companies on real world problems uh, using some of the frameworks that they've used in our class. One of the things that is special about uh, this experiential learning initiative that we lovingly refer to as impact is that we have a team of second year MBA students who help plan and execute the program. Our student managing director this year is Alex Johnson and Alex will be representing the audience to share your questions. If you have a question during the conversation, simply click on the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen uh, and submit your question. Audience members will be able to see all of the submitted questions and upvote them. Given the size of our audience today and our limited time, we will prioritize the most popular questions. Let me tell you a little bit about Alex. Prior to coming to Goizueta, Alex managed data-driven projects for such organizations as the San Francisco 49ers and California College of the Arts. And he spent his summer internships working in revenue strategy at United Airlines. His diverse work experience has made him an asset to the student leadership board, where he's embraced the challenges presented in delivering an, an exceptional Impact 360 experience. Before I introduce our guest, Ed Bastian, I'd like to take a moment to thank Jeff Rosenswag, for leading his, this important conversations this afternoon. Jeff Rosenswag, as many of you know, is an Associate Professor of International Business and Finance and serves as the Director of the John E. Robson Program for Business, Public Policy, and Government at Guizueta Business School. Most of our alumni know Jeff as Dr. J, and I've had the extreme pleasure of getting to know him as a friend and as a colleague and as a supporter and most importantly, as one of the school's most long-serving committed faculty members. He has been just a tremendous asset to the business school, and it's through his relationship with our guest today that is allowing us to have the opportunity to hear and on a, a wonderful conversation between Dr. J and our guest today, Ed Bastian. So now let me introduce you to our guest. As CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian leads a team of 90,000 global professionals that is building the world's premier international airline, powered by a people-driven, customer-focused culture and spirit of innovation. A 20-year Delta veteran, Ed has been a critical leader in Delta's long-term strategy and champion of putting Delta's shared values of honesty, integrity, respect, perseverance, and servant leadership at the core of every decision. And I'll just add a personal note here, uh, because in my history, I am a leadership professor, seeing CEOs who value the tenets of, of leadership in the way that Mr. Bastian does is really a hallmark. And it's just been a pleasure to get to know him and watch his leadership in action. Since being named Delta CEO in May 2016, Ed has expanded Delta's leading position as the world's most reliable airline while growing its global footprint and enhancing the customer experience in the air and on the ground. And during his tenure as CEO, Delta has become the world's most awarded airline. And I know uh, Dr. J will have many uh, examples of, of the awards that Delta has, has received under Ed's leadership. Before we get into the conversation, I would just like to take another personal moment to say that so many of the students who are on this uh, call today and our faculty and staff have had the pleasure of enjoying what we now refer to as the Delta Leadership Hub in the Guizueta Business School. And that room and the support of our leadership fellows at, across the business school comes uh, directly from the generous support of Delta Airlines under the leadership of Ed Bastian. Started with a breakfast conversation at the Four Seasons and it led to uh, identifying 
points of overlap between what Delta was trying to achieve and the ways in which the Gorzweta Business School could support those efforts. And those conversations ultimately culminated in a partnership that has really served uh, our goal, which is to build and develop more, more leaders uh, through our student population. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. J, to share a conversation with our guest today, Ed Bashton. Well, thank you, Erica. And, you know, you being uh, asked to be the Dean of Warden surprised no one. I don't think it surprised Ed. However, I've always predicted you'll be the um, president of a major university someday. So this won't be your last stop. Ed, we're delighted that you're doing this, especially when you are probably the CEO, busier than any in the country. I noticed we have over 550 people on this, which is the largest audience we have for anything other, one, other than when all the parents come for graduation. And, you know, Erica talked about how the two of you with mutual respect came up with the Delta Leadership Program. Something that's always impressed me, and now more than ever, about Delta is the two-way loyalty. The loyalty that Delta has for its 90,000 employees and the loyalty that they show to Delta. I think an example is the people taking voluntary unpaid furloughs to help you through this period, but Delta providing full benefits, et cetera. Is, I would like to hear how that two-way loyalty, how you develop it. And I assume one part is the fact that Delta has given a world record profit sharing with its people. $1.6 billion in this past year and 6.5 billion over the last five years. So I'd love to hear about the two-way loyalty. Well, thanks Jeff for having me and Erica, congratulations to you and thanks for your friendship and leadership in our community. We're gonna miss you in Atlanta. Uh, you know, when you talk about people, Jeff, that's at the core of who we are. Uh, we're an airline, of course, but we're a people business. We're a service business and flying planes is just what we do, but serving people is where our passion is. And for us at Delta, and we go back to our founder, uh, Mr. Woolman, 95 years ago, had a very famous saying that we, we speak to this day, that if the better job you do taking care of your people, the better job your people are going to be equipped to do taking care of all of you, our customers. And we live that, live that out every single day. And if people watch the actions, they, they listen to, to what's, what's happening, and they know that there's, there's a confidence in the leadership team, just like we have confidence in our, 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 our 90,000 strong, they have confidence in the leadership team, that when we need to go get through a tough time like this, uh, people respond, and, and it's, it's remarkable. Uh, we have almost half, we have 40,000 people, close to half our staff have volunteered to take anywhere from 30 days up to a year off without pay while we're in this in the in the throes of this terrible pandemic where airline traffic has, has, has really dissipated so i'm proud of them i'm wonderfully uh uh impressed i'm always impressed with our people but never so much as in times of crisis like this and i i know you've taken about 50 percent out of your operating uh costs right away which puts you in a much better position than any other airline going forward I'd like to editorialize that you have a multiplier effect inside communities when you have paid out that six and a half billion dollars over the five years. It probably means $15 billion of spending in communities, including ones that have great diversity like Atlanta and Detroit. But I would like to talk more about values because you've now led or helped lead through three crises. 9-11, uh, the 2008, 2009, Great Recession, and now this one. And I think the reason Delta comes out stronger each time and relatively stronger to other airlines, and well, again, is because of your values. Could you speak deeper to those values, those, what are they, and more importantly, how do you inculcate them? Uh, sure. The, uh, the value that we, we to try to design, I try to design you know, within our leadership culture is one of serving leadership. Uh, we are there to serve. And we're, we all serve in different ways. Uh, we serve more than just our people. We serve our customers. We serve our community. We serve our partners. And I always tell people before they come to work at Delta 
that you know the, the the main requirement we have is that they have to have a heart of service. They have to care about people. They have to have it demonstrated in their in their past uh, uh, life experience in, in any way they can, and they really care about about taking good care of people. They're proud and they and they care, and that's where the a lot of the values that that we we're needing to dip into during this crisis time uh, are, are really sorted out. We uh, early on here, I, I, I said that there's there's you know, a number of things that we need to do to manage through this pandemic. But the one thing that people like to say about crisis is people think that crises build character. And you're right, we've been through a number of crises, you know, 9-11 and the recession and now this, the, the, the granddaddy of all, of all crises, which is what we're in now. I, I don't think that's true. I think crises reveal character. They don't build it. And that's when people really stop and watch what people are doing, see how they respond. People remember how they were treated when you were at a time of crisis. And that's why I think we've had the opportunity to build on our success because people know we've taken good care. We've done our very best to take care of our customers in this really difficult time and take good care of our people. A lot of the alumni who are on this call are management consultants and I'm sure they'd agree with you about the the service, they fly millions of miles. I'd like to talk about contingency planning because obviously you had good contingency plans in place, a number of, because uh, Wade alumni work in that area. Could you tell us a little bit about the contingency planning that helped you uh, respond so well, but also what did you learn that might impact how you do contingency planning in the future for future crises? Well, anyone that tells you they had a plan for this, they were, they're lying to you, right? I mean, this is, this is beyond anyone's uh, imagination. I, I got a call from somebody yesterday, uh, a, a, a leading CEO, I won't, won't mention their name, and they asked how I was doing. And I, I said, well, considering I, ha I don't have any revenue for about a, a month now and I'm still alive, I guess I'm doing okay. I, I, I'm thankful for small, uh, small pleasure like that. But this, this was one that, we had we knew as soon as you know late February we saw the we saw the illness the the virus spread from China to Europe and particularly Italy mm -hmm. was where the the next hot spot broke out. We knew we had a real problem on our hands, and we moved quickly to shore up what we considered to be the, the those the priorities that we needed to have to manage through this. Uh, first priority is we got to take the best care of our people and our customers, protect their safety, protect their well-being uh, to make certain they know that's that's impo more important than anything we do is that our customers and our employees are safe because we're, we're continuing to fly through this pandemic most businesses have been you know reasonably shut down or put to sleep we're, we're still operating at delta a thousand flights a day uh, because we've been deemed by the government to be essential and we are essential and while a lot of people are not traveling people that are traveling are traveling on very essential purpose whether it's getting to a, to, a, to a family situation in an emergency, or we've carried thousands of volunteers, to, to medical volunteers, to get to the front lines of, of the crisis, to, to you know, moving, whether it's from Florida to Atlanta to, to New York, and trying to, to transport people to, uh, to, to fight, the, fight the virus. Uh, transporting you know, medical equipment and PPE out of China, you know, too. So there's a lot of reasons why we're trying, but we got to make sure we're doing it safe. Second thing, we got to, hold our other precious resource, which is our cash, you know, close. And we got to make sure we, we build a good nest egg because we know this can be a long crisis. It's going to be a long winter uh, for us. And we've raised, uh, gosh, uh, close to eight, between eight and $10 billion in just the last 30 days that we've got on, on the balance sheet. And we're going to need to, to raise some more and we will raise more. And the third thing is that we make sure that we are ready for the recovery. We don't do anything in this period of time that, that causes us not to be able to respond and recover as quickly as we need to do, because we know the airlines are going to be vital to the to the to the turning this country back on. The economy of this country is driven in large measure by the strength of the airline community, because you know our, our country is very connected, and we now realize how connected it is when we are forced to disconnect. So those having those priorities front of mind, put them right into action. And that's the, those three priorities are, have driven all of our planning. 
Speaking about priorities, uh, Dean James mentioned and I mentioned how many awards uh, Delta wins, including for diversity. And I know diversity and inclusion is a core value at Delta, and I see it, and it's a core value of ours at Cozueta. But another thing you are winning awards for or in lists of the top uh, companies is sustainability. I just graded my students' final exams, whether they're undergrads and MBAs. Sustainability seems to be the issue of our time. And I know my fiance, Natalie Allen, who uh, is someone you know, was talking to your head of marketing communications, Tim Mapes. And I guess that was a very exciting initiative that was uh, reported, I think about a billion dollar program or something. And I think it's been recently stated by your team that we're gonna go through with it, even with this crisis. Could you talk about this and uh, your views on sustainability and even a more sustainable future beyond this crisis? Yeah. Well, we know sustainability is our, is the issue of tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. The issue of today, obviously, is, is getting through the pandemic and, yeah. and getting the virus contained and making sure that all of our people are safe and protected and the health and welfare. And then the economic you know, impact that's, that's, that's occurred and the recovery from the, from the economic hardship as, as the world has been shut down as to how to get people secure, not just physically, but also financially. So these, though, those are the things that will always, uh, you know, our health and welfare comes, comes before anything. But we also know that for our company to grow and we, we you know, this is a pause, but we're going to, you know, continue on our growth journey once we get the virus contained, we need to be able to grow in a sustainable manner that we're not growing at the expense of our planet, we're not growing at the expense of our children's futures, that we are taking the, the and making the investment now to build that sustainable uh, planet and that sustainable uh, set of resources for our future. In our business, that's jet fuel. And jet fuel is about 98% of our total emissions. Our footprint is driven by jet fuel. Uh, we know uh, there's not a uh, solution uh, on the near-term horizon to fly airplanes around the world on anything other than jet fuel, while sustainable aviation fuels and biofuels, there'll be opportunities to invest. But we needed to make a commitment to offset, you know, that, 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 that impact uh, that we are having on, on the, uh, the environment, doing it through traditional means, through, through carbon offsets, which you can acquire on the, in the market. But more importantly, investing in real projects, investing in opportunities to replenish the earth's resources while we're, while we're growing a profitable business. So you're right, Jeff, um, while the, the short-term issue has, has changed its character in, in just this last 60 days from when we made that announcement, we're not deterred because we realize our goal is to be around for another 95 years. And the only way we can guarantee that is ensuring that we have a sustainable product and service line. Well, I would like everyone on the call. There's now 600, so um, you, uh, you're passing the test of the marketplace. The numbers are rising uh, to learn more about uh, Delta's initiatives uh, and, and a goal to be carbon neutral when, when you uh, look at the totality of uh, projects. You know, in recent interviews on CNBC and with Fortune, you made a point that really struck with me, which is how the quality uh, airlines or in general quality businesses, if anything, they can arrive uh, stronger at the end of the pandemic um, as others, you know, might even disappear. Um, Delta, nine years in a row, has been uh, selected as the number one airline by business travel news. And that's looking at people who really know the difference, like the corporate travel managers. This last year, you were number one in all 11 categories they look at. You're also nine out of the last 10 years, the most um, admired company in Fortune, et cetera. But the point you made is again, that the quality firms are the ones will end up stronger, which happened the last two crises. Could you talk about how you have people now, maybe while there's some slack in the business, reimagining a Delta of the future, reimagining the customer experience and how, you know, the new Delta will in many ways uh, come out stronger or even with higher quality at the end of this crisis. Well, thanks. Uh, we, we do take great pride in our people and our brand and the quality of our, our service. And, you know, when we're 
battling this, this, this health crisis, you know, the thing that's clear to me is that at Delta, we've always put safety at the top of our chart. Flight safety, it's our number one core value. We don't advertise it because, because it's just who we are. And every day we spend enormous amount of time and analytical rigor in ensuring the absolute safest form of transportation is within the US aviation system of any system in the world, of any form of transportation in the world. We need to take that same rigor and analytical depth to personal safety with respect to health and hygiene and sanitization and all the things that we now have seen that we're vulnerable to because of the pandemic. And I think customers, in fact, I know customers going forward are going to value the quality of the experience that much more mm. than ever before because of what we've all been through. And we, we've all uh, been through a, a, a life altering experience here in, in, in lots of different ways. And I don't know what all those, you know, the knock on effects will be in terms of follow, follow up behavioral changes, but there will be changes behaviorally. And one thing I know for sure is customers are not necessarily always gonna look for the cheapest absolute price. They're gonna ask a question, what, what airline do I feel safe with my travel? Do I know it has the best reputation for service excellence and can make certain that they're, they're, they're looking after me and they've got my back as much as I want to, uh, to believe in. And, th and that's the company that customers will reward with their with their uh, their business, their loyalty, whether you're a corporate traveler or a leisure traveler, and I know that's our sweet spot because I know that's who we are. So we're spending the time while there is a lull in in traffic, uh, reimagining the experience. You know, we got the airport experience completely being you know going through upside down, and yeah. whether and how how we can make certain it's safe, it's distant, uh, people have the opportunity to feel protected at every step of the way. We we announced. Uh, uh, last week that we were going to require masks on all of our customers, just as we require them on our, our frontline uh, customer service agents. Um, uh, customers, actually, there was a little concern as to how people are going to feel about being forced. People, uh, actually, customers are, are applauding us on that. They, they realize that they're there for their safety is why they're, they're wearing the mask. Uh, we've changed how we board planes. We now board from the back. Yeah. first and so that people sitting in front don't have to sit there while you know lots of people kind of parade through the cabin to the back and we when we on the on the other side as we the plane we make certain people aren't getting up all at the same time you know mm -hmm. human behaviors when a plane lands everybody gets up to collect their belongings and yeah. you've just destroyed all the distance we've created in the journey for the three hours prior so and we, we've capped our load factors at 60 percent uh, so that there's plenty of space on board. So these are all the things that we'll be doing over the next couple of years. Things we'll certainly continue with, you know, the cleanliness, the hygiene, the investment in care will stay the same. Hopefully we'll be able to fly full planes once yeah. there is a, uh, uh, a vaccine that's widely available that people feel safe with, and we'll continue on our growth journey. But in this, this short period of time, we're making a lot of changes to the travel experience. Yeah. I'm going to jump ahead to a question because you've made me think of it. Before I do that, I know you have a division called Tech Ops where you take care of your own airplanes and engines. And I think you exported, I think about, I don't know, but dozens of other airlines, I think, come to Delta to overhaul their engines. So that, I think, speaks to your, your safety and your quality. Um, I heard that when the decision was made to fill the plane from the back, not with the first class people, uh, I think it came from one of your frontline employees. And I think it speaks to your leadership style, which is very collaborative. Um, it's not like a 20, 20th century style, you know, very top down, dictatorial. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your, your more 21st century style, more, more collaborative, more empowering. You know, have you reached out to CEOs, maybe not even in your industry or to people in your C-suite? And, you know, you have very experienced people on your board of directors. Maybe you could talk about your style that way. Well, accessibility uh, is really important, I think, in, in today's society. And because of technology, uh, we, can, we, can, we can be even more accessible, even though we're all required to be distanced from each other, we can have this conversation yeah. and have 600 people join us on it, which is, which is right. wonderful. But one of the things about the pandemic that I know is really important is, is communication. Um, 
you know, it's always important to communicate. It's always important to be very visible and very present. And our, myself and our team pride ourselves on that. But it's even more important to communicate when you don't have the answers. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to communicate when you have the answers, but it's even more important to communicate when you don't have the answers. And it's important for people to see you say that you don't know. It's okay. People, you, there's a vulnerability and there's a, there's a, 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 a human element of, of, of approachability, of, of being able to relate to, to someone in crisis that, that pulls us in and when you, when you feel like in our jobs we do, we feel like we always have to have the answers. You, you give the test and I have to have the answer. Yeah. It, you know, going through something like this, none of us have ever been before. It's okay to tell people we don't know. So, yeah. so we've done a lot of virtual town halls. Uh, mm -hmm. I've done a bunch of them and our sky hops and we get thousands and thousands of people that dial in and, and listen to and, and they can see me. They don't just have to hear me on a line or read a memo. Communicate that way too, and we can talk about the issues that they have, and we're doing it continuously on a weekly basis. And I always encourage them to send in; they'll, they'll send in questions while we're doing the town hall. But I always encourage them to use my email box with any questions, and I always make it make it a point to get back to them personally. And I see that it doesn't go to some phantom email; it comes to me personally. They all know my email, and I read them. And a couple uh, weeks back, uh, a flight attendant said, "You know, wouldn't it make sense that we boarded." The plane from the back first and I, I thought about it immediately I said well I'm not sure that how our customers would feel about that but I thought about it for a few minutes and said she's absolutely right so I our next leadership meeting because we're, we're meeting every morning these days I said to the team I said you know we need to think about this I think there's something there and they, they all pick up on it and we implemented that change and so you know we're better when we're together with the 90,000 brains and minds and hearts of Delta working towards one end I, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I'm not, I should be measured by the quality of the team I put around me, not, not my own personal characteristics, because that will speak to what we built that will sustain us. Uh, if you're, you're relying on me to come up with all the answers, I don't know if we'll get too far. I think it's a good lesson for our students and alumni. Speaking about our alumni, um, we're very pleased many have moved already into management positions, and including at Delta. Other than maybe people in the, in the cruise line industry, no one is uh, leading through a crisis to the extent you are. But many of these um, managers and young managers and the judges in this impact competition who are on, it's a crisis in, in every industry. Could you give some, some uh, insight or even tips to, to often maybe these young managers who are also leading through a crisis? Yeah, well, um... You know, unlike the cruise lines, we've actually operated throughout. And while our revenues are really low, uh, you know, the cruise lines have been shut down. We haven't been shut down. So it adds another layer of complexity to what we're having to manage. We're having to make sure our people are safe while we're flying into New York, while we're flying in, we're still doing international missions. Uh, we're repatriating. We've repatriated, oh, I think, over 30,000 people from countries all around the world. Some countries we don't even fly to that on behalf of the State Department of bringing people back to their homes to be back, you know, in, in safe quarters with their loved ones because of the pandemic. And so while I said earlier, it was great that we have a lot of people volunteering to, to take time off without pay. We also have a lot of people, you know, putting themselves out on the front lines mm -hmm. in, in a, you know, what you can imagine to be a, a, an anxiety provoking experience at times you're going into some of these markets. But you're, you're doing it because you love people and you love, you love to serve. So, you know, first, first uh, priority, I, I tell everyone that are managing through this crisis to stay really close to your people. In yeah. real, and I, I know some, some businesses, many businesses have gotten into a real challenge. Can they even afford to keep their businesses on, their people on? And, and many people have, have been forced to let people go. But still stay in touch with them. Don't, don't, don't let go. Don't give up that hope that those people are going to, they want to come back and work for you and work with you uh, going forward. Uh, second thing is have a plan for what your future looks like. Uh, don't, don't just have a plan to get through this, this process. Have a plan for what your business looks like. And we'll, we're, we're trying to find ways that we can accelerate our future. You know, during this dead, dead time, such as in our airports. We're building a lot of new airports at LaGuardia and LAX out in LA or Salt Lake City. Well, the biggest challenge with airport construction is they're having to build it while there's you know, literally millions of people. You know, we're serving at the same time. Well, while we're not serving people, let's take the time to go harder to get those airports done sooner. 
and, and, and get by, by as a result of it, get it done faster. It may seem counterintuitive yeah. when you've got a cash flow challenge that you're actually spending more cash, but we know for the long term, those airports are going to be vital to our history. So think for the long term, even in these difficult times. And I think there's another thing here, Jeff, is it's about we're learning about patience. Mm. Uh, you know, it's hard as business leaders to have patience. I mean, I know I'm, I'm wired and I'm on the go and I, I'm never uh, happy unless I've got a bunch of different things going on around me at all times, which drives uh, my family and my coworkers crazy at times. But I, I, I love I love the I love the commotion and the, and the energy that that those projects. We're in a time that's that's a little different. We're in a reflective time. Um, we're waiting for a cure to this disease to come. It will come, uh, probably not for a couple of years, I think, before people truly feel safe right. that, that the, the vaccine is completely contained. And we're going to have to exercise patience and we're going to and caution in, in all things that we're not good at uh, as leaders. And we're going to have to be, be very explicit to ourselves as to what that means. Yeah, I'm supposed to ask, uh, ask about technology, but... I want to jump to something fun, which is you mentioned sometimes you're not patient and we can see when it comes time to be serious, you're serious and um, strategic. But I think Dean James knows and most people know you're also a lot of fun. So I'm going to ask uh, a little bit of a lightning round. If you didn't go into business, what would you most like to be doing? Baseball player. All right. Uh, Well, it's still hoping a senior league or something. (laughs) and is there a person or a book that you say that you think was most influential to your development as a leader and also your development as a person? You know, as a, as a leader, uh, Jim Collins, he's, oh, a, he's, he's yeah. a one of the, the good to great book that he wrote. I, I read that 20 years or so yeah. ago when he, when he wrote it. Uh, I can remember reading that and rereading it and rereading it again, cover to cover. Uh, so he's a, he's a great scientist as well as a leadership uh, guru. Uh, and he's a wonderful person. He's become a good friend of mine. And I've had him do a bunch of stuff here at Delta uh, over the years. And uh, his, that, that, that book is timeless. Because, you know, I, I, like, like, like us all, we want to be great at what we do. Yeah. I don't want to settle for good. I want to I be great. Yeah. Well, I think everyone's going to read it right now. You know, one thing that you're very lucky is during your vacations, you can fly anywhere between Delta, but also your Sky Team members. You have so many partner airlines throughout the world. What is the favorite place you've ever been? And if you've already seen it on your bucket list, what is the next place you would like to go? Oh, it's, that's hard. I've, I've been to a lot of great yeah. places. You know, I, I always enjoy going to Europe. Uh, you know, Europe, whether it's Paris or London. I was in, uh, in Tuscany, uh, couple summers ago or, or down to the Amalfi Coast. Uh, mm-hmm. Europe, Europe to me is, is, it just has so, so, so much history, tradition, pride each in every country and nationality has its own unique style. And, yeah. and it's, I, I, I would take anywhere in Europe at any point. I, I love, I love going to Europe. Uh, two places I've not been to that, that are on my bucket list. Uh, one is going down to Cape Town. Uh, oh, yeah. I've been to Jaybird, but I haven't been to, to Cape Town. But I, I need to get to Cape Town. And I, I need to get to New Zealand. I was talking uh, the other night with the CEO of Air New Zealand, who's a good friend uh, of mine. I've never been to New Zealand, down to Auckland and Christchurch. And yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm dying to go down there. Those are two places. They're, they're, they're a long ways away, uh, but I, I, I will get there one day. They're a long way, but I, I, I'll move you into first class. <laughs> I don't think I'll worry about that. Um, I'm going to ask you a final question because we're getting so many from students. Uh, But as Dean James said, we're so fortunate that Delta has created uh, and sponsors our leadership development coaching fellows program. Um, And a motto of that program is that feedback is a gift. What advice can you give to our our young leaders and our graduates uh, about receiving feedback? Well, feedback is a is absolutely a gift, um, and feedback's hard to deliver. I mean, it takes it's it's not easy to deliver. I, I you know just recently I had to deliver a couple months ago some to a couple team members that I didn't feel were necessarily at the level I, I was looking for them to be performing at, and had to have some some pretty good heart to hearts with them. 
you know, even after doing this for 40 years, it's still hard. I mean, because you, yeah. you care about people, you don't want to hurt yeah. their feelings. Yeah. But the, the, the most important that you, thing you can do is actually deliver them mm. the news in a caring way, because that shows you care about them more than if yeah. you don't give it to them and you, and you avoid uh, those, those tough discussions. So, so feedback is really, really important. Mm. You know, mentoring is really important. I think as leaders, it's our responsibility to continue to raise the next generation of leaders up and take a number of people under our wing, uh, formally, informally, you know, casually, however, but paying attention to the people and letting those people know that we notice them. You know, yeah, there's so many, right. so many people in a company like Delta is 90,000 people. Um, I, I make certain that every single Delta person I come in contact with knows I notice them, whether it's on a flight or in a break room or at an airport. It takes me a long time to get through the airports and lots of people yeah. want to take pictures. And even with yeah. masks, I'm taking pictures and selfies. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's interesting, but, but noticing them because people want to know that you care about them and yeah. they don't know how much you care until they see that, uh, okay. that, that in action and they'll really care even deeper about you and about the company. Yeah, and I know you get out there so much and, and do touch people in all the, all the different hubs. I'm gonna turn it over to Alex Johnson because I noticed there's so many questions from students. Thank Professor you, Ed. Rosenzweig, sorry to interrupt the fun and hello, Ed. Hey, Thank Alex. Thanks for joining us. You know, on behalf of the entire Goizueta student body, I mean, we are incredibly excited to have you here. So, Thank you. Yeah, there are- An honor for me to be with you. Of course, yeah. So we've had a lot of questions come in. Um, I'm going to start off with one from Michael. Uh, he asks, um, first a comment, you've spoken a lot about values, and Delta's values throughout this conversation. How do you ensure that those values are being held throughout the organization? Well, you, you do it by talking about it a lot. The reason why I'm talking about it on this, this call is because that's what I talk about every day every single day, of, of it, it, including during this crisis, even more importantly, because there's a lot of tough decisions that we need to take. And we're gonna need to take decisions to reduce costs, to cut back in areas, to, to make some changes in our investment philosophy, decisions that will impact people, you know, hopefully only for a short period, but those, those are really hard, hard to come by. And you can only make sure that you're getting to the right decisions if you're, if you're making them from your values. Um, you know, the, and, and the, the thing about Delta that we talk so much about our values is that people know what, what to do when you're in, a, in times of a crisis because your values aren't something that, we, that, that you put on a book and you put on a shelf and you, it's an exercise that you update once or twice a year. Values are something that you live every single day. And so I think our ability to respond as quickly as we have responded is because we knew who we are. We, we knew the values that we believed in and that we didn't have a whole lot of time to sit down and say, well, what should we do now? The, the team thrust itself into, into action. In, for, in fact, one of the proudest times I was ever uh, of my team, it's a personal matter, um, uh, unfortunately, my mom died at the, the end of February in New York. Uh, it, was, it was somewhat unexpected. It wasn't COVID related, but she was in the hospital in New York Presbyterian. And she died at the end of February and, and we buried her the next week up in New York, the first week of March. And there could not have been a worse time for me in my life. You know, when, when going through a personal tragedy like that, at the same time, your business is coming undone at the same time. But I was able to spend that week with my family, focus on my mom, focus on her memory, focus on making certain that I was taking care of myself while our team was taking all the decisions, all the steps right at the beginning of this crisis to put that in motion. So I was able to come back to work that next week and we just kept running hard. And so when you talk about values and you have, you have that kind of connection to who you are, I had no, and they said, I know I wasn't even talking to them that, that week because I just wanted to be by myself and wanted to be with my family. And, and they, they knew and their ability to jump into action, I was really proud of. So that's just a, that's a live example of what your values do for you. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm sorry to hear that. No, oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Greg Barnes. Uh, he asks, as the CEO of Delta, uh, how do you plan on making customers feel safe again after COVID-19? So uh, in reference to you know, a lot of these new technologies that we see, yep. these uh, temporal scanners, UVC lights, electrostatic sprays, things like that, what is Delta doing? Well, we, it's, it's the question of 
you know, this crisis, you know, what, what are we all going to do to feel safe in society and as we move forward in public, large public settings? In an airport and an airplane is a large public setting. Well, we're doing all the things you mentioned about the hygiene of the air, airplane, the sanitization of our airports, our facilities, our, our jetways, our jet bridges, the electrostatic cleaning, the fogging, every single airplane is being fogged. People are being distanced. You know, we don't, we're not booking the flight so that more than 60% max uh, of people are able to sit in, in the main cabin of the airplane and only 50% in first class. That's a, that's, that's a rule we put up upon ourselves. No one, no one imposed that. So there's a lot of steps that we're, we're doing to make certain that uh, the planes themselves are safe in the air. Both you know, the filtration systems on our airplanes. We use the same filtration systems on our airplanes that hospitals use. It's HEPA high quality filters that recirculates and cleans the air every three or four minutes when you're on board. We need to do more, adver not advertising, but more awareness of just how safe the environment on the plane truly is. And there's, there's more to come. But the other thing that we know is that we have to get the very best medical expertise around us. I'm not a healthcare CEO. I feel like I'm a healthcare CEO these last uh, six weeks, but that seems like the only people I'm dealing with. And I'm talking to the CEOs of all the largest healthcare providers uh, at every part of, this, of the chain from you know, those with point of care to the developers of, of testing and diagnostics to the pharmaceutical companies that are racing for a cure and all the way down to the vaccine developers and how all that will be delivered. And we've got to think through that entire chain to make certain that we're getting the best care. We're lucky in Atlanta with CDC, you know, down in our, in our backyard working very closely with CDC. But we've enlisted a panel of expertise, of experts and medical advisors um, that we haven't announced who they are, but we'll be announcing them soon that are help guiding our decision. I mean, I think there's gonna be two really fundamental core components that are going to get people back out you know before you get to the vaccine the vaccine candidly i'm not sure it's going to be out before two years it's going to be about two years uh, hopefully it'll be sooner but we got to be prepared for it to take that period of time to be available on a widespread basis where there's not millions of, of applications but billions of, of applicants because everyone in the world will need to get this vaccine but in the short term we got we got to we got to have testing that people know, so because I think one of the risks today that people have is the fear of not knowing. They don't know enough about the virus. They don't know about whether they've been exposed to the virus. They don't know, you know, how many people you know they could come in contact with. Are they safe to, to to be with or not? Social distancing really it just provides a layer of protection, but it doesn't really cure the cure any of the problems we're looking to solve. So getting testing out and being able to be able to draw inference from just how how what's the real risk to a real to an individual that they can make that decision for themselves as to whether they should be on an airplane and candidly for a lot of people that risk is minuscule it really is but people don't have the data because we haven't been able to test enough of the population to know what the real you know mortality rate is what are the demographics that are most we need to rather than working through all these phases of bringing the businesses back we got to look through kind of more risk assessment you know, who are the high risk people? Who are the vulnerable? What are the riskier businesses that we got to be a little more careful? And what are the lower risk businesses? And we need to start talking about it in terms of risk rather than just in terms of, of, of a disease. I mean, it's just, a, it's a different way of thinking about it. And we will have, we will be testing our own people. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to let our people know and whether you've got the antibody or not, make sure we're working up with quality lab services that really understand that. I myself went to get tested two days ago. Um, I haven't gotten the results yet, but it's a quest test, but I'll let you know when I find out. But I think people need to know how vulnerable they are and where do they fit on the risk pendulum. And then the second thing that, that we've, we also, none of us have is, is tracing. We need to be able to trace, and through technology we can do that, trace who we've come in contact with that later we found out we may have been you know, inadvertently uh, exposed to and be able to access and help those people through. And so I think those are gonna be two vital you know, interim measures until a full vaccine is, is, is released that we need to be more mindful of as a society, not just as an airline. Ed, as I said, you really are our de facto um, commencement speaker and you know, people on this call, the undergrads, the BBAs, the MBAs, PhD students, um, could you give them some advice as they go out into the world? 
Uh, sure, Jeff. And uh, first of all, I, I'm sorry that the uh, that I'm your commencement speaker. <laughs> I wasn't planning to be your commencement speaker, but I'm pleased. I'm thrilled to have that opportunity. Besides, as I said to you earlier, I've always wanted to do a commencement speech in my shorts. So that's what I'm doing, sitting in my home office here in my shorts. Uh, um, uh, but I, you know, this is a very unusual world, an unusual time for all of us. And, you know, there's a real sense of separation. There's a real sense of loss. Um, we miss being in touch with each other. Uh, we miss the contact. Uh, and as a result of that, my, my hope for the, the graduating class here is that we'll be able to, as we get through it, and we will get through it, and everyone will, will figure this out in terms of their own business, their own walks, we'll, we'll all take uh, note of what we missed along the journey here these next uh, year or two during this bumpy period and have a, a higher sense of appreciation for things we took for granted, higher uh, respect for relationships and, and human contact, uh, opportunity to go travel and to go see people and be connected, once again, physically, not just through technology. It, our spirit longs that. And I think that's one of the things that our hearts are heavy with. Now, you know, obviously we're very, uh, you know, filled with emotion for the people that are going through this crisis. And the, the, the loss of life has been just unbelievable. It's been tragic and there's awful stories. But at the same time, life is for the living. And we've got to lead by example. We need to be brave. We need to be courageous. Uh, I, my, my pep talks to my fellow CEOs and other businesses, we got to get out of our living rooms and not lead, lead from the living rooms. Our people are going to look to us first to get out and let them know it's safe. We need to be cautious as to how we do that. But we need, we need, to, be, we need to be brave. And then this is a time for courage. And each one of you, that are graduating from Emory, not only do you deserve enormous congratulations because it's a heck of a school and a heck of a program, and I know you're, you're a tough, uh, you're a tough uh, grader there, Jeff, uh, <laughs> but the, the reality is our world needs you more than ever. Our businesses need you more than ever. Uh, your, your innovation, your, your thoughts, your having lived through this, this tough experience, you're going to bring a different perspective to us that we all need to know. And um, while it's going to be tough the next couple of years for all of us, and we're going to have to live with some unusual uh, societal patterns, uh, let's, all, let's all hope and pray that this is something that's going to truly bring us closer at the end, and we're going to be a more united world, and we're not going to be as divided, and we're going to understand the things that really matter uh, that are dear to us, and that's staying very close to each other. That's right. Ed, with those inspiring words, I have what I hope will be at least a surprise and inspiring. But it goes way to business school, not every year, but every few years at most, when we decide that someone is truly deserving of a global leadership award. Um, and, and Dean James works on that, myself, uh, Associate Dean Lynn, Lynn Siegel, who's head of the IMPACT program, Someone you probably know, uh, Associate Dean Ken Keen uh, with the leadership program. It's only every few years that we see global leadership that is, like you say, courageous, strategic. Um, you were talking about the difference in getting ready for the long run, for instance, continuing to spend money at LAX, et cetera, not just tactical, but strategic. And ultimately empowering, empowering of your people. We give a global leadership award. Uh, the last time we gave it a few years ago was to your friend David Abney, CEO of UPS. We, okay. Yeah, yeah, and he speaks so highly of you. And um, we gave it to the Indonesian ambassador to the U.S. when we were growing much closer relationships with what is the world's fourth most populous nation. Um, we've given it to another friend of yours, Ralph De La Vega, when he yeah. put AT&T Mobility together with over 100 million customers after the mess of singular. Well, I hope this is a surprise. Only it is only a your surprise. team knows know about that. it because they've been working with the media and, and one of the most respected media outlets that has great respect for you. So this is gonna unfold. But we couldn't be more honored that you are the keynote speaker for our wonderful IMPACT program, our de facto graduation speaker. And in future years, when we decide it's time to give a global leadership award, I think when people hear that David Abney won it and a few of those others, but particularly at Bastion, they'll feel particularly honored 
to win that award. Wow. Ted, as I said, you're a great leader, but you're also a good person and a fun person. And we look forward to on the end of this, getting you back in the classroom live. And now I'm gonna turn it over to someone that you have so much respect for, I do, the students. We would be angry at uh, Dean Erica James for leaving us, except I think it shows the quality of what she has done at Guzweta and we've all done together and working with you. If Warden comes down to steal our Dean, we're doing something right. You're doing, you're doing a, lot, a lot right, and Jeff, thank you. I, I, I am surprised, I'm humbled. Um, that's an amazing uh, award. I, 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 I really appreciate it. And yeah. you know, at a time like this, when we're looking for things to lift us forward through this, uh, through the murk that we're all living yeah. in, personally, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You're, you're very kind. You're very uh, kind. Listen. And when the media explains this, there's going to be a lot of people know about it. But I'm going to turn it over to Dean James. And while doing that, wishing her uh, Godspeed. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Ed. Thank you so much. It was a riveting conversation. Jeff, you are a master uh, in interviews, and this certainly held up to your reputation. And Ed, thank you so much uh, for your words. As a leadership professor myself, I want the 595 people who uh, were on this call at, at its peak uh, to know that what you just experienced was truly a masterclass in leadership. So we, I am grateful for you for taking, for taking this time. And there's no one more deserving than this Global Leadership Award than you. So thank you so much, Ed. Well, th thank you, Erica. And you, uh, Jeff said it well. When, when Wharton comes down and, and steals our finest in Atlanta, we all should be very proud. And I know you from the first time we met, I, I could tell that you're, you're, you've got, you've got great, a great pathway for further growth and development and coming at it from a leadership uh, standpoint. There, there was a, pers a very grounded perspective as to what your students uh, need to be able to be successful in, in today's world, and you're a great model of that. And thank you also for the award. It's, it's very humbling of me to receive. Well, so well deserved. We know you have a hard stop at four o'clock, so we will let you go. And again, just want to offer on behalf of the entire Goizueta Business School, our sincere pleasure for taking time with us today and for your leadership in the Atlanta community. Thanks so much. Thank you, Erica. Take care. Bye-bye.